Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Ann Miskey, Chief Executive Officer of Union Station Homeless Services, who has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Ann, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Homelessness over the last several years has really exploded throughout the United States. We see it both in rural areas and in urban areas. An urban center like Los Angeles with its incredible span is a real center of homelessness in the United States. Talk about homelessness and talk about how your organization seeks to address this, this endemic problem. Absolutely. So you're right. Homelessness is something we're seeing exploding all across the country. It really is a crisis. But it's not a crisis that's just happened in the last couple of years. It's actually built on years and years of a variety of things. Uh, lack of uh, resources around affordable housing. We see the mental health crisis where we didn't provide enough support at the community level for those dealing with mental illness. Uh, we have wars that have happened and veterans coming back with PTSD. All of these things have combined over years and lack of po public policy that has really dealt with these. So now we are seeing the result. And of course in places like Southern California where the cost of housing is just skyrocketed, we're seeing every day more and more people fall into homelessness. And many of these people have never been homeless before. We're seeing record numbers of seniors. We're seeing people losing jobs or not having livable wage jobs that can no longer afford housing. So all of these things have combined to what is now a crisis in our communities. So you have the source of the problem, and there are multiple sources. There's not just one thing. There's not just one silver bullet issue that we can resolve and all of a sudden homelessness will evaporate. And then you have the fact of the problem. Right. So the source is enormously complex and it's uh, multifaceted. But then the fact of the problem is that we have people on the streets, we have people in their cars, we have people who, families, different, different requirements, right. uh, young people, women who are uh, pregnant and need care, need health care, people who are old mm -hmm. and need the kind of care that they, that, that they require, people with different conditions, drug addiction, alcoholism, but also just standard health, health uh, issues. All of these people require some sort of care right. if, we, if, if we are going to live our own values. How do we approach this problem? So I like to use an analogy. I like to compare it to the healthcare system. You have people, say for example, you have someone in your family who has cancer. You want to make sure that you've got resources and support and help to help that person hopefully you know, um, get better, to deal with quality of life, all of those things. But at the same time, you want to make sure people are looking at what are the causes of cancer? How do we look at it from a big, uh, cancer big perspective? Research. Cancer research, all of those things. You can't have one without the other. And they need to inform each other. So that's the way we look at homelessness. We're working on the ground. We are reaching out to people living on the street. We are helping people into housing giving them the support they need to be successful in housing. So this is the direct services This is component. the direct services, and we actually have a triage system very much like hospitals have. We look at who are the sickest, who are the most vulnerable. We're going to serve them the first, and we're going to provide the most intense services, all the way down to people who maybe just need a hand up. At the same time, we're also looking at those big systems. We're looking at the research, at the data. Where is homelessness coming from? You know, I sometimes feel like I, well, like we're bailing the Titanic with a teaspoon in terms of the homelessness sector. We're trying to help these people, but the inflow of people becoming homeless is just growing and growing. So we need to balance and we need to do both. So one is direct services, dealing with, the, with today's need and tomorrow's uh, coming need. Mm -hmm. And then the other is the systemic change. How, and, and this is where data, yeah. this is where we actually have to pay attention to truth and where yeah. data and reporting on data is so important. If we, if we start to allow in this field um, this pernicious sense that truth and untruth have equal mm -hmm. value, we inhibit our ability to address the issue. And, and it's true for every issue, but in this particular issue, it's particularly important because there is no obvious answer. We need data. We need data to guide our own research threads and our own actions on the policy and on the practical level. 
I couldn't agree more. I mean, we see all of these untruths, these myths coming up, which are really ways of society and individuals saying, it's not us, it's, it's not my fault, it's, it's those people. Else. So when you start presenting facts, one of my most uh, favorite fact versus uh, frustrating myth is the idea that people choose homelessness. I hear this all the time. People oh, they choose want to, to be homeless. Uh, they, they want to be homeless. Want to be they homeless. don't want help. They're service resistant. Okay. If you actually look at the data, and it, take for example our service area, which is San Gabriel Valley, Pasadena and San Gabriel Valley, almost all the people that have been identified who are experiencing homelessness are signed up in our system. There's nothing for them. There's no place to go. They are not service resistant. They are housing waiting. They are waiting to get into housing and there's nothing for them. So, you know, my guys will go out and say, how's it going today? Can we get you something? Can we get you help? What do you need? And they're going, I need a home. And we're going, sorry, there's no housing available. So this myth that everybody is out there, they're choosing to live in tents and live on the sidewalk is exactly that. It is a myth. These people, we know them, we're building relationships with them, we're providing as much as we can. Until there's housing, they're still going to be in that tent on your street. Well, it's even worse than that because this whole, whole idea of service resistant um, goes beyond housing. It, go, it goes into jobs. It goes into um, gaining access to the services that are available. Um, it goes to the whole issue of how people interact in, in society. And basically, if you're able to tell yourself that these people are, um, are marginalized because they choose to be, then we have no responsibility exactly. at all. It's their choice. Uh, you know, we don't want to see them. It's their choice, but we don't want to see them. And so let's use law enforcement to move them yep. into a place where they're invisible. On the other hand, if it's not their choice, then we as a society have to think about what we, and that's an awkward process. Yes. How much do, do we have to pay to help our fellow uh, uh, person get a hand up? What actions do we have to take? What policies, mm -hmm. what profit can we otherwise receive that we now have to ameliorate because we have a duty to civil society to make it better? Yeah. Uh, so, so we're kind of avoiding our own our own change. I think what is interesting and what is important to know, and this again speaks to the data, is by leaving people where they are, by not doing anything or asking law enforcement to be our solution, it's costing taxpayer, taxpayers way more than actually getting to solve the problem. By helping someone, by providing them support, by providing them permanent housing, the costs dramatically reduce. And this is one of the reasons that homelessness has been one of the few bipartisan issues across the country and at the federal government level. We see people bo on both sides of the spectrum really focusing on housing first is the best solution because A, yes, it's humane. It's also the most effective in terms of helping people and providing stability. It's also much cheaper. It costs us way less money to put someone in a home and give them full-time services than it does to leave them on the streets and rely on the police, the hospital system, which is overburdened, addictions, all of these things. So that's where facts are really important. So you can do it because you're humane and you believe people deserve a home, or you can do it because you're saying it's way cheaper and less burden on taxpayers. So let's talk about another myth. Uh, another myth beyond the whole question of being service resistant is that homelessness is a consequence uh, mostly of mental health issues and addiction and and other kinds of an inability to to uh, function. Talk a little bit about that myth. I think that's a really important one. Yes, there are those people who become homeless and they have a mental health condition or they have an addiction. But we know there are way more people who live in houses with addiction and mental illness. In fact, we all probably have family members, friends, colleagues who suffer from these things. That does not cause homelessness. It can make people more vulnerable to becoming homeless, and I use the analogy of if you have a weak immune system and the flu is going around, you're more likely to get it. But the flu system, the, the flu is not the immune system. It's, That's right. It, it, it just is a weakened immune system makes you more susceptible. You're not choosing the flu. You're not choosing to be homeless because of this vulnerability. It's because you don't have family resources. You don't have society resources to help you if you have mental illness. So it is, you're more likely to fall into homelessness. 
But the other side of it that a lot of people don't realize is a lot of people become homeless because something has gone on in their life. They've lost a job, there's been a, a terrible death in the family. Then suddenly you're living on the streets. I don't think any of us who haven't experienced it can imagine the trauma of what it is to live on the streets. Not to have anywhere to, to use a bathroom. Not to be able to sleep at night because you're afraid of being attacked. Women afraid and often are sexually assaulted continually. The trauma of that every day creates mental illness. Of course it's going to do that. The other thing is drugs. A lot of people who have become homeless turn to drugs often because it allows them to stay awake at night so they feel safer because it, they feel very vulnerable at night. So they'll get addicted to things that will keep them awake during the night. They take it as a way to numb the terror and the pain. They're often preyed upon when they're on the street by pushers. And some of them use it because they no longer have access to pharmaceutical drugs. Maybe they have schizophrenia or something and they can't get access because they're living on the street. So they use So they're self-medicating. So, so they're self-medicating, self-soothing. They're using it to stay awake. Um, this is not a recreational uh, situation where, um, and, and, and the other piece that I thought was, was really interesting is that very valid point that homelessness uh, places one in such a stressed environment mm -hmm. that the consequence of homelessness can become mental health issues without treatment that spiral into a interactive reinforcing yeah. uh, cycle in which one spirals and spirals and spirals without any kind of, of way to address that situation. Exactly, and you see people who develop that fight or flight syndrome because that is literally the brain changes when it's under such traumatic stress, mm -hmm. and so people react differently. That's why when we see people get housed, even if people are addicted and have extreme mental health, we get them into permanent housing. What we see very quickly is people start to get on the path to health. Now they may need support, you know, if you have something like schizophrenia, it's not that you're gonna be cured with housing, but you're in a situation where you're getting medication, you're getting support, and people's mental health improves, their physical health improves, obviously their feeling of self-worth, which is huge, will improve once they get into housing. We're no longer in a place in America, and certainly not in Southern California, where we keep those people out, because those people are in our community, they're from our community, and you can have the whoever move them next door, and your next door community is gonna move their folks to your community, and we're just gonna see it grow and grow. So until people say, okay, let's get housing that is affordable, let's, let's support services, and make a community that's wonderful for all of us, unless we get that, we're gonna keep seeing the numbers grow. And Miski, thank you so much for describing this amazing work of Union Station Homeless Services, your employees, your partners, your volunteers, your funders. Thank you so much for talking about the issue of homelessness in the United States and in Los Angeles County. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much, it was a pleasure.